Okay, thank you, Nicola, and good morning, everybody. I'm speaking from Kampala. I just arrived today. The signal's not great, uh, so I will repeat some stuff if necessary. Do let me know if it's broken up or in sustained section. This webinar is about non-experimental methods. The previous one that I gave that Nicola mentioned concerned experimental methods, particularly randomized controlled trials, also natural experiments, qualified experimental methods. But today we're going to talk about three particular types of non-experimental methods. So non-experimental designs can be divided into quasi-experimental designs, which attempt to create a comparison group in the same way you have a control group with randomized controlled trials. The first of those we'll talk about is propensity score matching. And the second is regression discontinuity design. The second type of non-experimental design are regression-based approaches, of which we will talk about instrumental variables, or IV. So in fact, both PSM, propensity score matching, and RDD do use regressions. But the distinction being made here is that they identify PSM and RDD identify a comparison group and basically impact estimate on single or double difference estimates using the comparison group. Whereas with IV, you don't actually identify formally a comparison group, though of course you do require data both from treated and untreated observations, households or individuals and so on. So the main advantage of non-experimental methods is they can be ex post. Of course, there are many times you may not be able to do an RCT, but a principal one is when you're called in to do an evaluation ex post when the intervention is already ongoing or even completed. And so all of these methods can be used for ex post designs. They can also be used for ex ante designs when uh, an RCT is not possible. But even if you're doing an ex post design, you would still like to do a double, double difference impact estimate. So what's been the impact on the change in the outcome rather than just looking at the difference in outcomes at end line, uh, as you would do in an, an ex post single difference impact estimate. So to do a double difference impact estimate, you would like to have baseline data. And as we all know, the problem is often that baseline data are not available. So where can we find the baseline? There are a variety of means for trying to estimate a baseline when one doesn't exist, ex post. One would be to use existing data sets. So it may well be there are previous surveys, school surveys, child health surveys, rural livelihood surveys. Many surveys are going on which may have sufficient sample size in your project area to act as a baseline. And quite a large number of studies have taken this approach of adopting of identifying and adopting previous surveys to act as a baseline survey. Or alternatively, you might use monitoring data that have been collected um, by the project from the outset. But the problem with monitoring data is, of course, there's, they don't collect data in the comparison areas. So they're generally of, of limited use. Or alternatively, rather than using existing data sets, you might want to cre recreate a baseline maybe using existing data from a variety of sources. If you look in the 3 IE website, we have a working paper on estimating the impact of the earthquake in Pakistan. And for that, they recreated baseline using administrative data. So you have, for example, of course, the census, you have school census data, you have health facility data, and so on, all of which are administrative data, which are collected on a routine basis. And then they use also satellite data which are now available um, globally and across a period of time. So you simply specify the time and place that you require, and you can obtain this satellite imaging data. And more and more studies are making use of these data. So you can pull together different types of data set to create a baseline for your treatment and comparison areas. The final possibility is to use recall. So by recall, I mean asking the respondent about what happened in the past rather than what happened now. Now, there's a school of thought of, of purists that say, oh, you, shan't, you shouldn't ever use recall, it's unreliable. That 
point of view is untenable. All surveys use recall. When we ask adult household members about their years of schooling, we don't ask them, are you currently in school? Did you go to school last week? We ask them, how many years of schooling do you have? We ask parents how many children they have when they were born and we expect them to remember. It's not unrealistic. I remember how many children I have and when they were born. I think that major assets, cars, bicycles, I never owned a car, but if I had, I'd remember it. Things like this are things that people rem remember. On the other hand, if you ask them on what date did you vaccinate your child who's now 10, they won't have a clue. So you've got to think of what seems realistic to be able to recall. And recall can be quite important in, in matching methods, the quasi-experimental methods, to try and establish pre-intervention characteristics to use for matching. So it's important not to discard the possibility of using recall, but to think about what recall is realistic to use. So let's now go on and talk about the methods. And we're going to start with matching quasi-experimental methods. Now, exact matching is not possible. Exact matching would mean we match people one-on-one -on -one by all their characteristics. So if we have a farmer with a cow and a mobile phone in our treatment group, we need a similar farmer with a cow and a mobile phone in our, in our comparison group. If we have a household with an internal water supply and there are other characteristics a woman has in the treatment group, we need the same in our comparison group. And so on. If we have a businessman working, um, an African businessman starting up a business in our treatment group, we need the same in our comparison group. If we have former Nigerian president, good luck Jonathan, in our treatment group, then we need him in our comparison group. And the same is true of 1970s pop star Barry Manilow and the, the founder of um, evidence-based medicine, Semmelweis. You see that we don't both in treatment and comparison group. It's not possible to identify people that are going to match on the same characteristics of each individual in the treatment group. So you can't match one on one. Oh, here's a middle farmer in his 40s owning one livestock with a mobile phone and 0.5 hectares. We'll find the exact same person in the comparison group. Here's a woman with eight years education, lives in the household, her, her husband owns five hectares of land, and she has three children, two are still in school. We can't find an identical person like that in the comparison group. It becomes too difficult. So the trick of propensity score matching is that we don't match on the individual characteristics. We match on a single number called the propensity score. And that single number, the propensity score, is a weighted average of all these characteristics. So age and education, assets, and so on, are used to create a single number called the propensity score. And then we match treated observations against untreated observations with similar propensity scores. Where do we get the weights from to calculate this single number, the propensity score? It comes from the participation equation which is the formula shown at the bottom of the slide, which we've got by regressing, doing a probit regression, where the left-hand side variable, the regressand, is a dichotomous variable, zero or one, if the individual or household or firm or whatever takes part in the intervention. So if they take part, then the variable part is one. If they don't take part, then the variable part is zero. On the right-hand side, we have these various characteristics. So we estimate the participation equation and calculate the propensity score, and then do the matching, and then calculate the either single or double difference impact estimate. I'll explain this in a bit more detail. It's very important that the regressors on the right-hand side must be unaffected by the intervention. So baseline data are best since baseline data, data collected before the intervention started, are necessarily unaffected by the intervention. 
But if they aren't available, then we can use characteristics we're not affected, like age or religion and so on, or we use recall, for example, on major assets. Here's an example. I'm going to show this example and then explain how you implement the method, and then we'll actually look at this example one more time. So this is an example using demographic and health survey data from Nepal. The outcome variable is child diarrhea, and the intervention we're looking at is access to clean water supply, improved water supply. There's a number of different matching variables used, of which I've just selected three here. And the middle column where it says before matching is what we'd call the naive impact estimate. We're simply comparing child diarrhea in households which have access to clean water to, how, to child diarrhea in households without access to improved water supply. The problem in doing that is if you look at this table down this middle, middle column, you will see that these two groups of households, those with clean water and those without clean water, have very different characteristics. So for example, if we look at rural residents, 29% of those households who have access to improved water live in rural areas. Compared to over three quarters, 78%, of households that don't have access. Similarly, those with access, nearly half of them are in the richest quintile, top 20%, whereas only 2% of those without clean water are in the top 2%, uh, top 20%. Similarly, higher education, very big differences. So because the group with clean water and without clean water are very different, we cannot attribute the difference in child diarrhea we see, and there is in the last row, 18% versus 23%, we cannot attribute that difference to the fact they have clean water, because these two groups are not at all similar. They've got so many other differences which might affect, explain the difference in child diarrhea. Once we carry out propensity score matching, we see from the final column that we have much better what we call balance. Balance means that the characteristics of the treatment group and the comparison group are roughly the same. And so we see that I mean, they have on average the same characteristics. So we see that rural residents is roughly a third in each group, roughly a third in, in the richest wealth quintile, and 17% of the household's head has higher education. So now we've done the matching. The other characteristics of the treatment comparison groups are on average the same. And the only remaining difference is the treatment group has access to clean water whereas the comparison group doesn't. So when we see the odds ratio, the ex post single difference impact estimate of uh, child on child diarrhea of 1.53, so 53% higher child diarrhea in the treatment group than the comparison group, then we can attribute that to the fact that the households in the treatment group have clean, access to clean water. So how is it that we do pencil score matching? First, we need to get the data we require. Then we estimate the participation equation, I'll calculate the, the potential scores and establish region of common support. I've not mentioned that yet, I'll come back to it. Implement a matching algorithm to identify the match for each treatment group uh, individual. Then we calculate the mean difference outcome for each treatment observation and its matched comparative observations, and then average that over the whole sample to get the average treatment effect. Let's look at each of those steps in turn. The data can be ex post single difference, but a double difference is better, as I already mentioned. Most importantly, we need a common survey for treatment and potential comparison groups, or we need a survey with common sections, similar or identical modules, for both the matching variables and the outcomes. So we need to have data on the outcome, obviously, in the treatment comparison areas, and we need also data on the variables we're going to use to match the households, and they need to be asked in similar forms. So if one has years of education, we have a survey in project areas with years of education, and another national survey we'll use for matching, which asks for years of, uh, of completed education level, we have to adjust those variables to make them comparable to undertake the matching. If they're too dissimilar in the way the data were collected, then we can't use that characteristic um, for conducting the matching. 
Once we've calculated propensity scores, they're shown on this diagram. Propensity scores, of course, fall between zero, zero probability of taking part in the project, because that's what the participation equation is telling you, is the likelihood or propensity of taking part in the project, which will range from zero to one. Now, unsurprisingly, as we look at this frequency distribution, the histogram of the propensity scores for the treatment group in blue and the comparison group in red, we see that the propensity scores of the treatment group are to the right. They have higher values on average than the propensity scores of the comparison group, which fall to the left on average. In particular, there's no household in the comparison group having a propensity score of less than 0.3, and there's no household in the treatment in the so there's, sorry, there's no household in the treatment group having a propensity score of less than 0.3, and there's no household in the comparison group having a propensity score of more than 0.8. So if we were to include in our sample comparison households with propensity score of 0.05, 5%, they're likely to be very dissimilar to the comparison the treatment, the treatment households. And similarly, if we include households with propensity scores of 0.9 and above, they're likely to be very dissimilar to comparison households. So the, in the region of common support is the region of overlap in the propensity scores. So we simply select that range in which propensity scores of the treatment and comparison groups overlap. And we discard all the observations in the comparison group with large propensity scores from that lower threshold. And we discard all the observations in the comparison group which have uh, observations above the, the upper threshold, above which there are no propensity scores from the comparison group. We often throw away a lot of data when we do this, particularly from the comparison group, if we've got a large survey from somewhere else to match against the project survey. So when you're doing your power calculations, you have to allow for the fact that we're going to throw away a lot, and by a lot I mean half, of the, the data we've collected in order to establish the region of common support. Then we conduct the matching algorithm. So here we have in this diagram a red dot shows a treatment observation, and the blue dots show potential matches from the comparison, op comparison population, or comparison, sorry, comparison sample. And the numbers on the, along the line are the propensity scores. So our treatment observation has a propensity score of 0.59, and the nearest to that is the one just below it with 0.57 propensity score. So we'd match those two. So we're doing nearest neighbor matching. We simply match those two observations with each other. What that means for the calculated estimate, we'll see in a moment. We can also do nearest five. The nearest five, we take the five nearest neighbors, regardless of which side they're on, and match those. Or we could use what's called caliper matching and take all of those falling within 0 0.05 either side of the so actually it's caliper 0.1 actually, but it's 0.05 either side. Um, and you can use different range calipers to test uh, robustness. You could combine uh, a near, number of nearest neighbors with a caliper, so say nearest five, but no more than 0.05 either side. So there are various ways you can do the matching to identify the uh, observations you're going to use from the, the comparison sample to, be, to calculate the impact estimate. And how you do that is shown in this diagram. So we have here a number of observations. Let's just look at the first row for observation one. The, in, this, the value, these are actually children's test scores. The value for the treatment child is 48.2. And the values for the five nearest neighbors read across the row, 44.1 and so on, through to 35.8. So the first thing we do is calculate the average outcome for the matched observations. So for observation one, we have five matched observations, and their average is 42.4. For step two, we calculate the difference in outcomes between treatment and matched comparisons. So for the first observation, we take 48.2 minus 42.4, which gives 5.8. That's an ex post single difference impact estimate for this 
uh, observation. We do the same calculation for all observations, and then we calculate the average of the mean differences. So they're all the mean differences down that final column, and we average them to get the overall ex post single difference impact estimate on uh, test scores of this intervention of 7.4. So it's a straightforward comparison in mean outcomes between the treatment group and the comparison group, where the comparison group is made up of all these different observations which are matched on single observations in the treatment group, having thrown away those outside the regional common support. So let's look at these results again. Now we understand why the after matching balance is so much better than the treatment matching, the, the, treat, the before matching uh, balance, where there actually wasn't any balance. That balancing has occurred because we established a regional common support. Basically, there are many households which are very dissimilar in the treatment comparison groups. We've thrown the data on those away and we've restricted our data to those which have an overlap in pension score and are more likely to have similar characteristics. And that achieves the balance we see where we now see that they, they are similar groups when without matching the groups are very dissimilar. Let's move on to instrumental variables. The second method I mentioned was regression discontinuity, which is quasi-experimental, but actually RDD is a type of instrumental variable estimation. So I'm going to talk instrumental variables first. I do warn you this section of the presentation is relatively technical, but there are other places you can read up on it, for example, in, in the brief I wrote with Shagan that Nicola just sent the link to. So here would be a regression equation to estimate the impact using ordinary squares. We're comparing the outcomes of individuals that choose to participate or not, where T is the treatment dummy, where it takes a value of one, if the individual is enrolled in the program or the household or whatever takes part, and zero if it doesn't. And X are other characteristics that also affect the outcome of interest, Y, but which are not uh, affected by the program. And therefore, the impact estimate, and there's the error term, the impact estimate is alpha 1, the coefficient on the treatment variable. Now, for this to be a valid approach, which it's usually not, there has to be no selection bias. Selection bias means that by in some way or other, there's a relationship between the decision to take part in the program or being allocated to the program and the outcomes of interest. And when that happens, then the problem is that it's no longer true. There's zero correlation between the treatment variable, the T, and the error term, which is assumed by ordinary squares. And the selection bias, then treatment is a function of the outcome, that correlation is no longer zero, ordinary squares leads a biased estimate. So this is the problem of selection bias, which violates the assumption of ordinary squares. Instrumental variables is one way to solve the problem of selection bias. In this case, we identify um, a variable Z now, which is going to satisfy two conditions. And it shouldn't be a variable that's already there amongst the excess. The first is there is a correlation between Z and T. That is, this is a variable that's correlated with being in the program or not, the treatment variable. But it shouldn't be correlated with the error term. To put that diagrammatically, we can see there's an arrow from Z to T, Z affects T, and treatment affects Y. But there's no arrow from Z to E. And for OLS to work, there shouldn't be an arrow for T to E, but there is. So that's why we need to use an instrument. So we create Z, Z to T, but there's no arrow from Z to E. Um, the technique we use is two to three squares. We first of all, a regress T as a progress regression on all the X variables and Z. We calculate then the fitted value of T, and we use that in the second equation. That's now T hat. We regress the outcome on the regressors X and T hat to get the estimate of alpha alpha 1, which is the trick. So the second equation there looks like the first one, more or less. The T, the treatment variable, had been replaced by estimated value from the first stage equation, 
uh, the, using the instrument Z to get the fitted values for T. That's instrumental variables. It's straightforward to do. The problem is it's difficult to find what we call valid instrument, one that meets the conditions of being correlated with T but not correlated with V. Here's an example where this method's been used, a study of dams by S. Duflo and Rohit Bandy from J. Powell. And the background is that there are lots of dams in India. There are over 4,000 dams. It's the third largest field of dams in the world. And there are good effects of increased irrigation and so on. But there are bad effects of displaced population and, and so on. And as we know, lots of protests against dams. So this study wanted to evaluate the impact of dams, agriculture, and poverty reduction. The problem is there's selection bias. Because dams are not just put anywhere. Dams are put in areas where we expect there to be good economic growth. And so you see a relationship between dams and economic growth. It's because dams are put where there's growth rather than growth becoming the echoes of the dams. So all of these squares estimates would be biased in the way we saw earlier. So what they argued is that the river gradient, which affects the dam construction and the use of a dam, is a suitable instrument. So in low gradient rivers, this is areas suitable irrigation dams, and high gradient uh, rivers, areas suitable using dams for hydroelectric power, as you see in the two pictures. And so the assumed the relationship between likelihood of dam construction at all and river gradient is the basis for the uh, identification strategy. That's how we're going to estimate impact, where river gradient affects having a dam and having a dam affects poverty. But it's assumed there's no direct relationship between river gradient and poverty. So then we regress the number of dams per district on the river gradient of the river in that district and our variables, and then we use the predicted number of dams from that regression in the second stage regression where the outcome variable is poverty. And they conclude that po the poverty results suggest that worsening of living standards in the district where the dam is built. So there's an example of using instrumental variables. Finally, let's look at regression discontinuity designs. Regression discontinuity designs are used where there's a threshold allocation rule. There's something which divides those who get the treatment, the program, and those who don't get the program. So an example would be a poverty line where households below the poverty line get a conditional cash transfer and those above it don't, or nutritional programs where children are admitted when they're malnourished, or actually when they're malnourished or the households below the poverty line. Age is a threshold for school admission, for pensions, many other things. And test scores are used to award scholarships. Many of the early RDDs were looking at um, the use of test scores in awarding scholarships in developed countries. So we then estimate a regression with either a, a dummy of the threshold value or just put in actually more usually the threshold, uh, the, the, the variable itself, which is the threshold variable. And when the threshold is not perfectly applied, we use a fuzzy RDD. The RDD is actually an example of an instrumental variable est estimation where the threshold uh, variable is the instrument. It's a, also a bit different because when you do RDD, the, the basis of the estimate is that when you've got a threshold, that threshold is somehow arbitrary. And the households just either side of it are basically the same or the individuals, firms, children, whatever, just either side of it, are basically the same. And so you can treat them as being a valid treatment and comparison group and you estimate the impact around those using just the data from those households or individuals or so on around that threshold. Whereas an IV use the whole sample. And we'll see that in the example I'm going to give. So here's the idea of here of I here here's the idea of ID, RDD. Before the intervention, you see a relationship between um, the, out, the outcome of interest and uh, uh, some variable, which in this case is the poverty line. And there's an th eligibility threshold shown by the vertical line below which households are eligible and above which they're not eligible. After the intervention, we now see an improvement in the outcome variable, which is household expenditure, shown by this jump in the regression line. 
This is why it's called regression discontinuity, because there's a discontinuity in the regression line at the point of the eligibility threshold. So we allow this jump in the regression line of income of expenditure on poverty at the threshold, and we see this jump. That is the impact of the program. Uh, properly speaking, this line, this, li this graph doesn't show it very well, uh, is meant to be estimated just from the observations around the threshold. And that's what we estimate to be the impact. Let's see a real life example, one of the first published examples of this being done in practice back in 1999, which looks at the Maronitis rule in Israel, which says that no class size should be larger than 40. And let's see what this graph tells us. So in the table here, we show the number of pupils in a, in a particular grade, and the number of classes it therefore has, and the average class size. So once you get to 40 pupils, you should have one class, and the class size is 40. Once there are 41 pupils, you have to now have two classes, so class size drops down to 20.5. It then starts to increase again until you get to 80, where you have two classes, average of 40 each. Once it gets to 81, you have to then create a new class, there are three classes, average class size drops down to 27. Same again, 120, average class size now drops to 30. What you see is each time the class size reaches a multiple of 40, you introduce a new class size, and the average class size drops down, but to a lesser amount than before. So this is shown by the dotted line in the graph, where we show that as the class size reaches 40, with 40 pupils, a new class comes in, it drops down to 20, it goes up again to an average size of 40, with 80 pupils, drops down again to um, 27, climbs up to 120 pupils, it drops down to 27, and so on. The dotted line shows data on actual class size collected from schools in Israel. And we see that the actual class size pretty much, not exactly, but pretty much mirrors the line that you expected by the application of the rule. Therefore, we can see that this is a reasonable a threshold that's being reasonably applied. So, the data show the rule is largely followed. Now we've taken the predicted class size, so this is the uh, what we expect the average class size to be on the right, the top line, the dotted line, and the solid line is the average test score. Now there's two things we can see here. The first, as the text says, is generally there's a positive relationship after an enrollment of uh, around. 30 or so, a positive relationship between test scores and enrollment. So larger schools have better test scores. Um, the authors say this is probably because small schools are small rural schools in poor areas and so on. And so that's why they have low, low test scores. Larger schools are urban schools, better catchment areas and so on. But you also see that the test score line does jig jag in a opposite direction to the average class size. Average class size drops, test scores go up, and so on. So you you might expect to see, if you do a proper statistical analysis, a relationship between the class size going up and um, test scores deteriorating, or vice versa. Smaller class sizes lead to higher test scores. So here's the only only squares estimate. This is a biased estimate. We're not controlled for selection bias. So with no controls, that's the first, that's columns one and four, looking at reading, reading scores and math scores in fifth grade, we see that um, there's an, an impact on the test scores, a, a positive correlation. Larger class size, actually larger test scores. So that's not what we expect. Once we put in controls, so we put in some additional variables in columns two and four and columns uh, three and six, then we stop. Sorry, come too far. Then we see that back. Then we see that there is a significant impact, a negative impact um, in reading comprehension, and it's significant, but not for maths. The signs are the wrong way, and so on. So OLS estimates don't actually tell us what we expect to see, but also we know those estimates are biased, so we shouldn't trust those estimates. If we go on and do instrumental variables and regression continuity, 
I'm sorry it's a bit hard to read, but IV estimates, where we're now using this predicted class size rather than actual class size as an instrument, we see that the impact on class size on reading without controls is significant, and with controls it remains negative and significant. That's true for reading, and um, it's virtually zero without controls. Once put controls in, there is significant impact also on math scores. So we see using instrumental variables, unlike OLS, which was biased, we do find an impact on, math, on maths and reading scores from lower class size. When we move now to use regression discontinuity design, which is the same estimation equation, but only using um, class sizes plus or minus either side of the threshold rule, so 35 to 45, 75 to 85, and so on. So it's just using around the threshold. So it's a better comparison group. It's more comparable. Then we see an even larger impact on, um, on test scores. So what we show in this example is actually the more rigorous the method, the stronger the relationship we find between class size and test scores. Reducing class size does improve test scores. This is a very important finding because the education production function literature has struggled to find a relationship there, but that is an equation of SPG's OLS which is beset by potential biases. A study like this that does a proper rigorous design can tell us really, yes, there is a relationship between class size and test scores. So it's a very important study. Uh, so that's what I said. So in summary, we've, I've talked about three methods, pencil score matching, regression discontinuity, and instrumental variables. Pencil score matching is statistical matching based on observed characteristics, and its main advantage is you can always do it. You can always do PSM if you have the data. The disadvantage is it really cannot take care of unobservables. So any possibility there's unobservables there, so for example, in the case of the poor water supply, the households that get, have access to clean water, are those households whose household head thinks, oh, hygiene's important, I'm going to get clean water, I'm going to make sure soap is available, I'm going to tell my children the importance of washing their hands, I'm going to make sure, uh, that, make sure the area is clean around the toilet and the food preparation area and they're kept separate, all those things that they're not collecting data on or not observing, they could create a selection bias and observe, based on observables that we're not picking up. And so PSM would give a biased impact estimate. But if we think we've got selection of observables, or we can have proxies for the unobservables and observe them, then PSM is a good method to use. RDD is a good method. It takes care of selection bias, including unobservables. But there has to be a threshold rule that's been applied well enough for the design to work. If it's not been applied totally strictly, which would nearly always be the case, you can use what's called a fuzzy RDD design, no problem. But if it's not been applied at all or too weakly, or there isn't a threshold rule, then you can't use RDD. Instrumental variables is becoming again quite popular. It's fallen out of fashion, it's coming back in. Don't need to identify a comparison group, you can do it ex post. The problem is identifying a valid instrument, and that's not very easy. But these methods are very important because randomized controlled trials are proving uh, more, more uh, feasible than we imagined when we started out on doing more impact evaluations 10, 15 years ago. But of course, there are always cases where randomization is not possible because we come in too late, because there may be ethical or political constraints on doing it. So we have to use non-experimental methods. And so it's always good to talk through the, whole, the, road, the, the, the range of methods available and to see which ones are appropriate and applicable and actually to do all that you can use because they, they rely on basically the same sorts of data. So you can do a range of approaches using the same data set as a, a form of robustness testing. Okay, thank you. That's the end of the talk. Um, now happy to take some questions.